Welcome to the Boneyard with Steve Robertson. As always, I am your good friend and host, Steve Robertson, here on the Wednesday morning edition of The Yard. It's just after 11 here in the Eastern Time Zone. It's, I'm in Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, program reminder, of course, you're getting your show earlier today. Uh, I'm leaving for San Diego today, and I will be there for the rest of the week. Uh, so your Friday show may actually turn into a Saturday show. As a result, we're going to do the South Carolina preview today because I want you guys to be well informed about what's happening with the Gamecocks. I have watched every press conference. I have read everything that I can find, and I think that I am as prepared for this game as any ever, okay? Uh, but because of our schedule this week, and I'm not I'm not in charge of the schedule. I'm just kind of here to pay for everything and uh, kind of go along with it. But um, we fly out Wednesday, and we're at the True Rest Convention Thursday and Friday. And then we just simply couldn't work out flights to get back across the country and be able to get to the game uh, in Columbia on Saturday. So I will uh, be covering the game remotely. Still probably going to do the play-by-play. We'll see. How it goes just kind of depends on what we can find and what we can do, right? But uh, you'll probably have a Saturday morning show rather than a Friday show. Now, I may surprise you and do it Friday. It just depends on how things go. I don't know what's going to happen while I'm out there. All I know is I'm supposed to be there, uh, me and the lovely bride, and uh, you know, going out there to uh, to kind of get up to speed on the latest on uh, float therapy. Mind you guys, too, we hope to be open by the end of the year. Things are going along great. Uh, we elected to go with uh, Tabor, a local company there in Starkville, to do our build-out. And uh, our guy, Will, doing a great job. Matter of fact, Will was in Nashville today, kind of going over and beyond the call of duty. Went to uh, the True Rest location in Nashville just to kind of get a feel of the vibe, right? To say, hey, I wanted to see what these things look like. And, of course... Uh, our liaison with True Rest is based out of Nashville, so she spent some time with him. Will got to float. Said it took you about uh, 15, 20 minutes to kind of get used to it, but he really enjoyed it. We hope you will too. Go ahead and tell you now, that first float, you're gonna, it's going to take a little while to kind of trust yourself. Uh, you're going to enjoy that. But once you know what to expect, you're going to want to keep coming back. So we've got a lot going on. And uh, I have been here for a couple days now. I lose track of where I am and where I'm supposed to be a lot of times in my life. And thankfully, I've got uh, a good wife and a good scheduler on the business side to kind of keep me uh, abreast of what's got to happen. But uh, ran off and left the microphone. Needed to get a new one anyway. So if this sounds a little different than what you're used to, it's because I've got a new mic. i got to play with it a little bit to find uh, the right... Uh, tone and gain and all that kind of stuff. This is a little more of a uh, advanced microphone. So if I sound a little different, it's not your radio. It's me and my microphone. But uh, excited to get out to the West Coast. It's been a while since I've been out there. I've never been to San Diego. I've had so many people that have sent me traveling tips and hey, while you're out there, you got to do this. I don't know how much time I'm going to have. I think Saturday I'll be able to get out and do a little exploring, but uh, I really want to watch college football. That's what I really want to do on Saturday. Uh, so it'll be interesting. We'll go out there and we'll rep the brand on the West Coast. We'll come back. And uh, let's see, next weekend, let's see what today is Wednesday. So a week from Friday, uh, the wife will be home for good. And uh, going full speed into true rest. And uh, but so many of you that have reached out and said, Steve, we can't wait to try this. Again, I'll tell you, I was a skeptic in the beginning because I don't believe anybody. That's just part of who I am, right? When people say, oh, this has got to be the greatest, automatically I'm thinking it's not the greatest. And that's a tough way to live, but that's kind of how your good friend and host looks at life sometimes. My wife said, this is going to be amazing. You've got to do it. I did it, and it was absolutely amazing. I can't wait to be able to float all the time. I'm going to float every week. I am. I can't wait because I'm the kind of guy when I wake up in the morning, like before I even put my feet in the floor, I'm already engaged. My mind is already kind of indexing about all the things I got to get done that day. So it's nice to be able to get a mental reset and just kind of let my mind be quiet for a while. It's incredible. Get to go in there for about an hour and just kind of chill away from the phone, away from the computer. There's nobody pulling on me and asking me questions or trying to get me to give them something. There's always that. And so it's nice to have a break and do something for yourself. We talk so much about uh, self-care these days. And there's a lot of things that 
we call self-care that is really just selfishness. But uh, this is truly something that is self-care. I think you get a lot of physical and mental benefits from it. So, uh, so look forward to bringing that to Stark Vegas, man. Can't wait. Making our hometown a much better place. Let's thank our friends at Bulldog Burger Company. They, they've they been making Starkville a better place for a long time. Part of the Eat With Us group, they know how to feed folks. Simple as that. You need to get fed? You want to have a quality meal at a quality price? Look no further than one of the great restaurants as part with the Eat With Us group. Bulldog Burger, that, that's the one, right? That's the one that we, we think about, hey, whether it's lunch or dinner or an evening out with friends, perhaps you just want to go have dessert, The best place to go is Bulldog Burger Company. Three great locations to serve you. University Drive in Stark Vegas, Gloucester Street there in Tupelo, Lake Harper Drive in the Ridge and Flowood area. Have the spring rolls as your appetizer. They will make you and everybody around you better looking. It's in writing. It's on the menu. And you you think that's a joke. It's not. It came from this show. This goes to show you what a great partnership we have with the fine folks at Bulldog Burger Company. Very proud uh, to work with these folks for many, many years. And I'm in there a lot. I eat there a lot. A lot of people say, hey, I'm not surprised to see you here. Well, you shouldn't be because I know where to go put my feet under a table and have a quality meal. And more times than not, it's going to be a Bulldog Burger Company, the place where people go to meet, M-E-A-T. All right, let's jump into this deal with the South Carolina Gamecocks. Let me share with you some of what I have learned today. I have worked from the moment that I've got up, that I got up, uh, other than the time that I sat here for a little while and watched Netflix with the wife for just a bit before she went back to work. And so, you know, I'm a bit of a workaholic and I'm like, you know what? I got to record this show tonight. I want to make sure that our people understand kind of what to expect. We go to South Carolina. First thing I'll tell you, the game is a sellout. So if you were looking to go to the game and you don't have tickets, you're going to have to get them from third party vendors. I, I have had great success with SeatGeek and with StubHub. Uh, my son had some issues with StubHub when it came to Omaha. When it, we, uh, matter of fact, we had some tickets we couldn't get, paid for them, couldn't get them. They refunded the money and credited us and upgraded their tickets, uh, so they made it right. And so I don't have a ticket sponsor at this point, uh, other than our, our folks at TickPick. Uh, and of course, you can uh, check out with Zip and uh, put those payments over a, uh, you know, over a, a cycle. But um, I'm just telling you, third-party vendors, that's the way you're going to have to go. And it's going to be a raucous atmosphere. Uh, Kickoff is 6.30 p.m. Central, Mississippi State time. The game will be broadcast on the SEC Network. South Carolina remains a slight favorite in the game. I've seen it three points, seen it three and a half. I suspect it'll come down just a little bit uh, between uh, now and kickoff. But we'll see how things go. I think this is going to be a very, very competitive ball game, and it may boil down to who makes the big mistake first. That happens a lot. This is a very even game, to be honest with you, and, and the odds makers see it that way anyway. You get about three points uh, just for being the home team. That's about where this thing is, but uh, let, let's kind of take a look and uh, you know, just kind of see where things are with South Carolina. You remember you know, we talked about these guys uh, earlier in the summer, Let's take a quick look back at last year and then uh, just the schedule. We're not going to do the stats and all that kind of stuff. Let's just look back at last year at their schedule. And it's weird, too. It's kind of an anomaly. It's one of the reasons why we need to change the SEC rotation. Thank goodness we are. Guys, we haven't played South Carolina since 2016. They're in our own conference. We haven't been to Williams-Brice since 2013. Remember that game? You know, we know why I remember that game. It's poor Dak Prescott. Right? Poor Dak lost his mom that same weekend. Had a terrible game at South Carolina. A lot of it, of course, you know, he had a lot on his mind and uh, didn't want to miss. And then uh, had to hurry back to Starkville and then get over to Louisiana. And uh, that's why I remember that trip to Williams Bryce. Is uh, that's again 10 years ago. It's been 10 years since we played at South Carolina. There is something wrong with that. You know, for the first dozen years or so, the South Carolina was in the Southeastern Conference. We played them every year. They were one of our permanent opponents. And then, of course, they began to change the rotation a little bit because Mississippi State was winning too much. And uh, so they changed it, and now we never see these guys. And now it looks like we'll see them pretty much every other year or every third year at the very least. And, and I'm told one of the 
benefits of the new scheduling model is that every student athlete will have a chance before they graduate to be able to play in every SEC football venue. That is a really cool thing. That's the way to do it. Uh, the way it's you know been structured for the last several years, not necessarily a good thing. But uh, yeah, so we have uh, we haven't seen these guys in a while, and uh, they lead the series nine games to seven. <clears throat> of course, we won the most recent matchup back in 2016, uh, 27 to 14, and the fact that we held an SEC team to 14 points or less with Peter Sermon as our defensive coordinator remains one of the great, life's great mysteries. But let's take a look back real quick here. You'll hear some clicking noise. Uh, so last year, eight and five year for South Carolina, R- a really good year because again, from year one, Shane Beamer and Beamer Ball had the Gamecocks maybe ahead of schedule. They made a ball game the first year. I think most people, including myself, expect them to go like four and eight. They had a good year, made a ball game. And uh, last year, built upon that, had an 8-4 and four regular season. They were equally positioned with Mississippi State in the ball pecking order. They really wanted to play Notre Dame. They didn't care where it was. They didn't care the circumstances. They didn't care the prestige of the bowl. They wanted that helmet sticker win. Turns out they didn't get it. And so they, they should have been slotted for the Relia Quest Bowl. But because of the, uh, the bowl tie-ins, they played in the Gator Bowl. So we kind of got elevated a spot because we were slotted for the Gator, even though we've been there a thousand times in the last decade. Uh, So that's kind of how that all played out. And, of course, we win our game, they don't. And so we finished with the uh, better record overall and finished in the top 25. Uh, They began the 2022 season with a win over Georgia State. Uh, They lose at Arkansas 44-30 and then get absolutely blasted by Georgia 48-7. It's been a while since uh, South Carolina's beaten Georgia. Georgia has uh, kind of made routine uh, defeats of the Gamecocks in the last decade or so. After losing that ball game, they bounce back and just trounce Charlotte 56-20. to The next week, 50 points again against South Carolina State. And, of course, they're stepping on a conference there, and you'd expect them to be better. I don't know that you expect them to, to put up uh, half a hundred in back-to-back weeks. The next week, I really thought they'd lose that game in Kentucky, but you remember, Will Levis didn't play. Right? Right? Yeah. And they win the game 24-14. to Kentucky looked like an absolute jailbreak on offense. Couldn't get anything done. And uh, Gamecocks go in there and take care of business. All of a sudden, this winning streak is stretched to, to three games. They compound that the next week, riding high, believing in what Shane Beamer's preaching, and they take care of Texas A&M 30-24. And, of course, A&M worst team in the West last year. But at the time, a lot of people thought A&M would still be a bowl team. They weren't playing well, but you didn't think things would go in the tank like they did. The surprise of the South Carolina schedule is they finally get in the top 25. Is they lose at home to Missouri 23-10. to Again, one of those things you look at and say, this just makes no sense, and it doesn't, especially considering the teams they had played. Four-game winning streak on offensively playing really well. Defense had come around as well, and they and they they, they, they lose to Missouri. It, it helped out Missouri because they ended up, of course, as you guys know, the grand conspiracy last year uh, the, of Missouri getting bowl eligible. I, I, I told you guys a month before it happened. They were gonna, they were gonna do it. They were gonna beat Arkansas and get bowl eligible. They did. That scenario wouldn't have been possible without this win in Columbia. The next week, they get Vanderbilt in Nashville, 38-27, and I would not have been surprised if South Carolina had lost that game. Vanderbilt was playing better. South Carolina kind of stubbed the toe a little bit. Uh, the next week, they travel to the Swamp and get beat 38 to six. You think, okay, well, this is it. This is it, man. The season's over. Nope. Shane Beamer and the crew said, nah, we're going to beat both of these orange teams, and they do. And they cost Tennessee a potential spot in the FBS playoff. And they beat Tennessee like a drum, 63-38. to Volunteers were ranked fifth in the country at the time. Just one of those days, man, where everything goes wrong. I don't think anybody wanted to fire Josh Heupel, but uh, – there were a lot of people that were really upset because obviously this cost Tennessee a chance of something spectacular. You think, okay, well, surely now they won't sneak up on Clemson. Well, I don't know that they did, but they went to Clemson and won 31 to 30. 
So great year last year, and of course they do lose to Notre Dame 45-38, but a very competitive game. Gamecocks, of course, ranked 19th in the country at the time of that ball game based on the strength of those uh, last two top 10 wins uh, to close out the year. Spencer Rattler, there was some discussion that you know maybe maybe he would go pro last year. Probably made the wise decision to come back. Probably so. And uh, you know he's having a pretty good year passing football. But uh, the Gamecocks currently one and two on the season. Of course, there are two losses to top twenty-five teams. They lose to North Carolina in Charlotte in Week One. We called that here on the show. Uh, 31-17, and then they, they get Furman 47-21. It was a game for a while, and there were some people joking that Furman might be the best team in South Carolina. you know. And then last week, they nearly pull off the upset. It's a one-score game late in the fourth quarter before Georgia finally puts them away. And, and don't forget, South Carolina had a 14-3 lead uh, in that ball game. And so this is a quality team. But life's about to get interesting. Really interesting, you know, because, of course, they get I, – I love how we're positioned on a schedule. I talked about that in preseason. After Georgia and before they go to Knoxville, before they go to Tennessee, we're kind of sandwiched in there perfectly. And, listen, I get it. I know it's a home game. But you get up and get up and get up and get up and say, hey, we're just as good as Georgia. And you nearly prove that you are. And then next week you got Tennessee lurking, a team that you embarrassed last year. So it's a nice sandwich game for us. I would feel better about it if it was at our place. But I, I feel like it's going to be okay. But uh, let's take a quick look, you know, at a couple things here uh, with our statistics with South Carolina. What's interesting to me about the Gamecocks, like, and, and you know, for those of you guys who saw that Nick Chubb injury against the Steelers on Monday Night Football, I immediately thought about Marcus Lattimore in South Carolina. Do you, you remember that, how bad that knee injury was? I mean, this is a guy that was going to be a, a surefire first-round draft pick, and he had his knee absolutely nuked. And then we kind of got to know the kid a little bit better after that. And then it's like everybody felt so bad for him because he was such a class kid. You think, And I hate to call him a kid. I mean, he was a young man who could buy alcohol. But, um, but you understand my point. That's the first thing I thought about when I saw that. You hate to see it. But, man, at least Nick Chubb has got some money in the bank, Right. You know, poor Marcus Lattimore was a guy that people thought was a potential Heisman candidate. And then his knee gets absolutely nuked, and it was never the same. And you hate that. You absolutely hate that. But uh, So I, well, I've always seen South Carolina, uh, whether you go back to the late 90s or whatever, they've always been kind of a team that would punch you in the face. They'd run the football. Uh, our Mike Nemeth, and I, know, I mentioned this in a note today in my first look column, Mike Nemeth. Back in 1980, that's right, yeah, 1980, uh, Mike had just shaved off his uh, lamb chop sideburns and quit wearing those uh, powder blue uh, bell-bottom pants that were so prevalent in the 70s, those plaid jackets, you know. Uh, But Mike was working for the University of South Carolina in media relations and uh, put together a Heisman campaign for George Rogers. Did you know that? Did you know that not only does Mississippi State and Jeans Page have a tie to a Heisman Trophy? Yeah, through Mike Nemeth. It's crazy. But Mike put this campaign together and really, really pushed. And, of course, Rodgers did his part. He rushed for over 100 yards a game in every game in a regular season, led the nation in running and rushing, and wins a Heisman Trophy. And Mike Nemeth was the guy that marketed that campaign. It's crazy. And they win. I always joke. I said, Mike, there should be a statue of you on on the campus there in Columbia. It's pretty incredible. And, you know, a couple of guys that he beat out. How about Herschel Walker and Hugh Green? Yeah, from Natchez, Mississippi, Hugh Green. Pretty incredible stuff. Um, But I've always fashioned South Carolina as one of those teams, you know, because they've had some decent. We've all been there before. You know, you got big weekend plans for some reason. It just didn't work out. Maybe life gets in the way. Maybe you want to head down to the casino. Maybe take some of their money. I like to do that. Well, my bookie's new and improved online casino is here to change the game for you. Dive into truly realistic casino experiences featuring the latest in slots, progressive jackpots, and live dealer action. All from the comfort of your own home. 
Take advantage of weekly blackjack tournaments and a brand new collection of high-end games for a chance at real cash rewards. The MyBookie Casino provides a Las Vegas experience when the action's in your hands. And the best part is you don't even have to wear pants. How cool is that? Your adventure at the MyBookie Casino begins today with a generous sign-up bonus using promo code BONEYARD. That's promo code BONEYARD to secure yourself a sweet deposit bonus. And that's not all. Because their revamped loyalty program ensures that you'll be showered with rewards, including free spends, cashback offers, and a host of exclusive VIP perks, the more you play, the more you'll win. Play anytime, anywhere with the MyBookie Casino. Again, that's promo code BONEYARD. Hey, Bulldog fans, you hosting a big shindig soon, maybe a horror movie marathon, maybe an impromptu game night with friends. You want to get cozy with friends and family and maybe even serve up some pumpkin beers? Yeah, great. Well, don't do it without Drizzly, the go-to app for drink delivery. With Drizzly, you can find all the right drinks for whatever you're planning and get them delivered directly to your door. Boom, hosting handled. Now, before you get back to folding napkins and carving pumpkins, download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y dot com slash hosting slash handled today. Again, that's drizzly.com, D-R-Z-L-Y dot com slash hosting dash handled today. Must be 21 plus and not available in all locations. Hey, Bulldog fans, do you like me? Do you enjoy live entertainment? Whether it be a comedy show, a play, a ball game, a concert, those events require tickets. Make shopping for tickets more convenient than ever with TickPick, the original no-fee ticket marketplace that brings you the best prices for all the events you love. And now, TickPick is partnering with Zips. You can shop now and pay later. Zip allows you to shop at TickPick and split your payment into easy installments. Visit TickPick.com, or better yet, install the TickPick app from the App Store and use promo code ZIP20 for 20 bucks off your very first purchase of $199 or more with Zip. Zip can only be used for U.S. purchases, and Zip may charge a fee at checkout. Certain merchant products, goods, and service restrictions may apply. See Zip's terms of service at www.zip.co slash US. Loans through Zip are originated by Web Bank, except for Zip originated loans in Colorado, Nevada, Massachusetts, and Maryland. Check out with Zip at TickPick.com. Shop for all your tickets at TickPick. Check out with Zip to split those payments into easy installments. Again, check out with Zip at TickPick.com. Quarterbacks at times, but you know, like, you know, Phil Petty was a competitor, you know, but he really wasn't the guy. He was more of a game manager. And I, I think I think he finished one game against Mississippi State his entire career. Then we knocked him out of the game. I remember Ashley Cooper just absolutely destroying that kid. Uh, but all that said, it's interesting that they can't run the football this year. That didn't make a lot of sense to me. Doesn't make a lot of sense at all. Uh, but offensively, total offense – it's uh, 1,231 yards of total offense, and that's a ninth in the conference in offense. When you look at the passing numbers, and that's where most of it comes, and that's a lot of it's Spencer Rattler running some RPO stuff. Second in the conference, second in the conference with uh, 1,072 yards passing. You know who's number one? It's Vanderbilt. Remember, Vanderbilt's got that extra game. So if you start doing a game by game, you break it down by passing yards per game. It's South Carolina, number one, baby, number one. Averaging 357 yards a game passing. You say, well, that's pretty good. It's kind of like what we were last year, right? You know, we'd lead in passing and, and really struggle in rushing. That's the same thing that's happened in South Carolina. Guys, they, they have rushed in three games combined 159 yards. That's it, averaging 53 yards a game on the ground, which is 128 out of 130 FBS teams. They can't run the football. You say, yeah, but they're still doing okay. Guys are one and two. Okay, so I, I don't know that we can go ahead and give an indictment here and say, or, or maybe pass out you know, an offering plate and say, yeah, it's working out okay. You've got to have balance in this league, and if anybody knows that, it's us. You have to have balance in this league because at some point, quarterbacks going to have a bad day. Right? 
at some point, you're going to have to have somebody make a play besides Spencer Rattler. We said all year long, all offseason, this team will go as far as Spencer Rattler can carry him, but he doesn't have a lot of uh, you know help around him. Well, they did return Juice Wells this year. You know, Juice Wells, preseason All-SEC guy. Got banged up a little bit in camp, missed some time in camp. He's kind of had a limited role. They were trying to get him ready for Georgia. He goes down and scores a touchdown in the first drive and then breaks his foot. He is out for this week. They do say it's not season-ending. That's what Shane Beamer said today. It's not season-ending. Now, I know there are some people on that beat that kind of disagree with that. I don't know if they're talking to other people or maybe they've had broken feet. I don't know. But uh, – a broken bone in your foot when you're a receiver and you got to push off and cut as much as they do, it, that doesn't sound like a quick fix to me. Maybe it's a month. I don't know. I don't know. They don't think it's season ending and you hate it for the kid. And you hope he makes a full recovery. But he is not going to play this week. And, again, they have played the first two weeks for the large, most part without him. They've been really careful with him. And, of course, they get him back up and, and running again and, uh, and he's gone. And so – it's crazy. Now, sacks allowed. It's another statistic, too. 126 out of – tied for 126 out of 130 schools. Now, the outlier in that is they gave up nine sacks in week one in North Carolina. And so that skews the numbers a little bit. Anytime when you start comparing statistics at this point, you know, we hadn't really played enough games yet to really hand out a lot of, uh, you know, certifications as far as excellence goes. But – this is an offensive line. When you look at the totality of things, you begin to realize this is an offensive line that's got some issues. Uh, they played eight offensive linemen last week, including a, a true freshman, a true freshman left tackle. And uh, you know, Trevon Bow is another guy that got some reps too, also a true freshman. And so they're already, they're already mixing and matching on the offensive line because of protection issues and an inability to run the football. And everybody that you that had a media opportunity today in Columbia, South Carolina, everybody said we've got to get the ground game going. So we do expect them to kind of work on that. And that's very important when you're trying to salt the game away. Think about last week with Georgia. You know, if they had had the opportunity to run the football successfully, they might have knocked off the number one team in the country. But they didn't, right? There's all these what ifs, right? They didn't get it done. But when you put so much weight on the shoulders of your quarterback, at some point, they're going to have a bad game. Simple as that. And hopefully it's this week. And when you've got an offensive line up there that hasn't developed a lot of cohesion and the fact that uh, you're putting some guys out there that have never had to play, you know, really gets a three-man front that blitzes them all the angles that we do, could be a chance for us to get home. And that's been the issue with us all year. You know, we had a ton of pressure against Arizona. We just couldn't get DeLore on the ground. We got a couple of sacks against Jaden Daniels, and he is as slippery, if not more so, than DeLore is in the pocket. Uh, Spencer Rattler is kind of cut from the same cloth. He's not the willing runner that maybe Daniels and those guys are, and I think that's a part of it too. Uh, when you look at the numbers here, you know, he's kind of running based on opportunity. There's not a lot of – there's not a ton of design quarterback runs for him. But we have not been able to get home at times. We may send six or five and then not get home. And then when we send both backers, uh, quarterbacks have been able to just kind of you know, fill up that vacancy in the middle of the field because we uh, have sent the house and not gotten home. That's got to change. And my, my hope is, and my belief today is, is that with this mix and match offensive line that really hadn't had a chance to gel yet, and the fact that we're so unorthodox up front – I think we're going to have an opportunity to get home. The, the difference is we're going to have to get him on the ground. We're going to have to get Spencer Rattler on the ground. All right, let's uh, look a little bit here into these numbers. As we promised, we said we would. Steve, you keep saying you're going to look at numbers, and then you, uh, you change your mind here. All right, so total plays, they've run 1,231. Their opponent's 1,219. Uh, excuse me, that's total offense. Total plays, they've run 205, opponents 216. So they're gaining about as much as they're giving up. Probably not what you'd want, considering you've already played your FCS opponent. Average yards per play is 6, allowing 5-6. Average yards per game, 410. Opponents are putting up 406. This is a defense that's been really beat up. 
A Beamer said today they do expect to get some guys back this week, but there are a handful of other guys that are questionable. And uh, kind of reading the tea leaves with some South Carolina fans and media members, uh, these injury reports that they give are just kind of for entertainment purposes only. Right? There were some guys last week expected to be available, didn't play. Uh, some other guys at times that have been ruled questionable at play without any issue at all. So that's something to consider, too. I don't know if we fully know. This whole injury thing is so interesting how everybody handles it, but I'm not going to chase that rabbit trail for long. South Carolina, 1,072 yards passing as a team. They've allowed 781. And so you look at that and say, you know what, maybe we have some opportunity here. I thought we'd have some opportunity last week. We just couldn't protect. This South Carolina front, not as talented as LSU. That's the thing you look at, too. You look at that wide receiver room for LSU. The South Carolina room, not as talented, especially without Juice Wells. And so they may want to run some of the same concepts. They're just not going to have the same quality of personnel. So, but you better believe we're going to see some of those same drag routes and things like that across the middle, try to run everybody off and, and then move across or across the middle. That's going to happen. We just got to be better prepared for it. Does that mean that we send one backer and keep one in coverage? I don't know. But uh, we're going to have to adjust based on how teams attacked us because LSU had some success with it. And uh, as a result, every opponent that we see moving forward will try to mimic that. That's what happens in college football. When somebody exploits a weakness, everybody else tries to exploit it. And so the thing with Delora was, you know, from Arizona, so much of what he did was unscripted, right? He just kind of dropped back the pass, and if it wasn't there, he'd take off and go, kind of take advantage of his opportunities. Could be a much different deal with Spencer Rattler. Could be. And we'll see. And the Daniel stuff was different because they were just scheming him up. They were running him basically as part of an extension of the run game. Uh, Spencer Rattler's been pretty good taking care of football as a team. They're 84 of 119 with just two interceptions. And uh, they've only picked off three passes, too. We'll get to some of the defense numbers a little bit later here. But, again, they've rushed for 159 yards. They've allowed 438 yards uh, as a team. And uh, not a lot of TFLs. That's one thing you look at, too. You, you start – want to measure somebody's front, look at their TFLs. How many TFLs are they getting? So South Carolina has not been especially strong on either side of the line. Uh, it's one of those things I've always heard, if you, if you just prove you belong here, you probably don't belong here, right? And I think that's one of the reasons they've got some freshmen there saying, hey, let's go ahead and get these kids to grow up right here because some of our veteran guys just aren't getting it done or nicked up or whatever. Uh, time of possession has been a bit of a concern there. And, again, if you can't run football, it's tough. It's tough to win time of possession. Uh, they've got a 15-minute differential between them and their opponents in that respect. Uh, they've been decent on third down, 42.9%, but they're allowing 45.2. Just two of seven on fourth down, but allowed four of six. So, again, here we go, line of scrimmage type stuff, right? Line of scrimmage stuff. You're, you're allowing more third downs than you're, than you're earning, right, and you're converting. And on fourth down, because more times than not, it's going to be a fourth and short, right? Uh, they fumbled twice, and they've given it up, and uh, their opponents haven't fumbled at all. That is an anomaly. If you, three games in, not a single fumble, even if they got it back. So you're not forcing fumbles. You're not picking off passes. So it doesn't sound like this defense is especially opportunistic. Again, uh, just three interceptions and no fumbles. So turnovers could be a big deal in this game. They generally are. But last week, we didn't turn the football over and got our, our, our skulls crushed. It's not always that simple. All right, looking here at the red zone numbers here, they have had 11 red zone attempts and converted eight of them. Opponents have had 13 and converted nine. So kind of a nip-tuck thing there. Uh, field goal attempts, they're one of two. Opponents are two of four. Um that's interesting, and I've got a lot of faith in Kyle Ferry. And, of course, get uh, Nicholas Barmira back last week. should give us another boost on uh, special teams is we ought to be able to kick the ball out of the end zone. You know, this is one of these numbers within a numbers thing. I always like to look at this stuff. I always like to look fresh with the powder drive when we look at these special teams numbers especially. Uh, they have not had a lot of returns. Uh, five for this 94 average and 18.8 yards of return. Uh, two punt returns for nine yards. Now, their opponents have had one return, so they're doing a good job too, and you'd expect a Shane Beamer coach team, the son of Frank Beamer, 
uh, to be good at special teams. So clearly they're doing a good job hang time wise and covering kicks because you're not getting a lot. And we need we need Xavion to have a chance, right? We need to be able to go out there and and eat up some yardage in special teams. Uh, Carolina uh, averaging 26 points a game, allowing 25.3. That's tough. That's really tough. All right, let's look here, kind of get a little more specific with these numbers here. As we get into the individual numbers, uh, Spencer Rattler, as I mentioned, having a really good year as a passer. Uh, His quarterback efficiency rating is uh, 154, and he has thrown 77 of their 84, excuse me, he has thrown uh, 108 of their 119 attempts and completed 77 of them. Got a couple of picks. Those came last week against Georgia, just the four touchdowns. They talk about how explosive this offense has been, and a lot of it's been this RPO stuff. You know, the threat to run sometimes opens up the pass, and of course, you know, Rattler is a playmaker. And so they've taken some shots down the field, and they've been successful. Uh, that's the thing that we got beat with against LSU is we get kind of lulled to sleep, and next thing you know – uh, they took a shot, and that fourth down shot still just wakes me up in cold sweats, even though we're uh, a few days removed from that. Pretty crazy. All right, on the ground, uh, the carry and joiner is the leading rusher. What would you estimate his uh, net yardage is this year? Guys, he's had 28 carries and 75 yards. That's it. A long of 16, averaging 25 yards a game. You'd think they're running the air raid, and I don't mean that in a derogatory way. They're not running the air raid. They're trying to run the football and just have not been able to establish the running game. Spencer Radler, 24 carries, a net of 21 yards. A long of 15, he's averaging less than a yard per carry. And so, again, you look at this whole dynamic and you look at him and say he is such an athletic quarterback, but he has not been a very willing runner. So you wonder how much of that is schematic, how much of that is Beamer and the staff saying, hey, listen, stay in the pocket, scramble a little bit, and then deliver the football. That's kind of what Delora did last year. But then they turned him loose this year. Will they turn Rattler loose as a runner? And there are going to be sometimes his instincts are going to take over and uh, he's going to go try to make a play. You might as well get ready and expect that. Uh, We talk about Juice Wells being out for this receiver group. There's still some guys out there, and they've got some young guys they're really proud of they think are going to be big players for them. Uh, Xavier Leggett obviously is a dude for them. Uh, He currently leads them in every receiving category, 22 receptions, 367 yards. So, he, I mean, he is on an all-SEC pace himself, just the one touchdown, but averaging 122 yards per game. That'll get it done. That will absolutely get it done. Amarion Brown is a guy that's been a little bit banged up. That they expect him to play this week, but uh, they have been very careful with him. Uh, two games played, uh, nine receptions for him, but that's a guy that's got a lot of ability. Omega Blake is a guy that stepped in last week after Juice Wells went down. Uh, he's played in all three games and uh, six receptions, 93 yards. He did meet with the media in post game. Uh, and it, they've been mentioned a couple times. They expect him to do some things for him. But uh, Juice Wells this year, uh, just three receptions for 37 yards. And, again, this is a guy that was a preseason all-SEC selection and is now not available. And you got to wonder, and you hate it for the kid. You start looking through this and start thinking, you know what, if this is a, a lingering thing, you know, what does that mean? You're only three games into this thing, and, and you start thinking, you know what, he's probably a pro prospect. I think we would all agree But if this is going to be something that may hurt his draft stock, maybe, 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 maybe you apply for medical hardship. Maybe you redshirt him if you can. I don't know. But uh, it's interesting. You know, again, you know, and again, they have kind of grown accustomed to not having him. They got a big emotional lift last week. Of course, he had, uh, you know, a couple of nice catches, you know, on that uh, that first drive there. Uh, Look at the defensive side of the football. Uh, Debu Williams. That's a straw that kind of stirs a drink. 29 tackles for them. Had a pass breakup and a quarterback hurry. Uh, Jalon Kilgore is a guy that got banged up in the ballgame last week and uh, just could not return. And uh, three games for him, but again, 23 tackles and not even playing one of the full games. DQ Smith's a guy, too, that they're really high on. Also, 22 tackles there. Our friend Stone Blanton uh, starting at linebacker now. 
And hey, good for the kid, man. And he spoke extensively about his Mississippi State ties and about how difficult it was to back away from that decision. And uh, Stone with 16 tackles already this year and uh, does have one sack. That's his only TFL. But uh, averaging just over five tackles per game. And you got to think, if we're going to be as run heavy as people expect us to be, we should be able to stress those backers. And we'll, we'll see how things kind of progress there. One thing I thought was rather interesting you know, when we bring guys up for media, and uh, I know it's not just me, but I like to ask about the upcoming game. And uh, South Carolina, had, if memory serves me correctly, had seven players come to media today, and uh, four of them did not get a single question about Mississippi State or this weekend's game. There are a lot of questions about their recruitment and about early playing time and a bunch of questions about Georgia. And uh, the thing that I always think about with that – and uh, maybe it's because of my coaching background or playing background. Uh, when the, when the game is over, when Saturday's game is over, you know, a lot of my questions about Saturday are over too. Now, I may ask Zach Arnett in the Monday press conference, hey, after you reviewed the film, anything that stood out, that sort of stuff, or an injury report. But we're, we're, we're moving forward, right? And uh, I, I think, and this was, maybe I'm being Pollyannish here, but I don't think the players want to talk about last week. I think the players are ready to talk about the next game. I think it's important that the fans probably want to hear about the next game too. Hey, what are we doing in practice? Are we improving? You know, what do we, what do we see from these guys? You know, I think you guys want to hear our players talk about their team. And so when I go and transcribe all these press conferences, I, that's what I expect to hear. It's like, hey, Mississippi State runs this and they do this and this guy's really good. And they didn't get asked the questions. It's not the kid's fault. Nobody asked the questions. It's just weird to me. It is. All right, so looking at special teams here, Kai Kroger, and just as we suspected, uh, having a good year. 14 punts, 43.5 average, two touchbacks, um, four inside of 20, three over 50. That'll get it done, right? That will get it done. All right, looking at field goals here, Mitch Jeter is uh, – seems like there's always a Jeter at South Carolina – uh, one of two on field goal attempts, and that's the thing I think about too, is like that's all you've had? I mean, just two attempts? And it's not like they're finishing a ton of drives. Uh, they were in position last week to uh, to kick a game-time field goal, and uh, Spencer Rowler got sacked. Uh, Mitch Jeter also, 14 kickoffs this year, nine of them touchbacks. Now, you got to feel like he's going to be a little bit jacked up, but you start thinking here, number one, you don't want him to kick off a lot, but – just over half the time, he's kicking a touchback, which means that a little bit less than half the time, it's a returnable kick. He had kicked anything out of bounds, and so maybe Tulu gets a chance. So we talked about that last week. Even as LSU as great as they've been, um, they have not consistently put the ball in the end zone as a as a kicker. And so Tulu had a couple big returns. We couldn't do anything with them, but uh, nevertheless, we had them. And so I think it's important, again, to look at the South Carolina team uh, and respect them, but also understand they've got some real problems, too. Uh, we get so acutely aware of what's happening with our team, sometimes we forget that other t- there are no perfect teams out there, right? Uh, and South Carolina, obviously, one of our contemporaries, you know, we're kind of similarly situated when it comes to budget and talent and things like that. Uh, so this is a chance for us to go up there and win a ball game. And I'm going to go and tell you now. I know it'll be an unpopular pick. I expect they to go win a ball game. I think we're going to win a ball game. It's going to be tough to go on the road and do that. Uh, but when you begin to kind of break down these numbers and kind of think about, you know, kind of where things are, I don't think we're a good matchup for South Carolina. And I think Mississippi State's biggest opponent right now is Mississippi State. I think Kevin Barbe and that group, they got to figure out what works for our kids. I do expect to see Mike Wright play more. Uh, this year, Mike had a good game against South Carolina last year. They didn't win it, but Mike played really well. And so I think you're going to see Mike a little bit more. I think Will starts and is on a short leash, but I think there's probably going to be you know, some design stuff for Mike that's a little more extensive than you've seen. That's just what I believe. And we'll see how it goes. But I do think State's going to go win the ball game. Uh, but I think it's going to be one of those ones that probably comes down to we probably need to make a play with our defense on the field uh, to end that ball game. But when you start looking at this 
South Carolina offense and people are talking about how explosive it is, it's very one-dimensional. And all of a sudden, if you're putting all this pressure on your quarterback to make these plays and you've got a blitz-happy scheme like Mississippi State has against an inexperienced offensive line, you could see why Spencer Rattler perhaps might make some mistakes with the football. Uh, so, again, is he capable of beating us? Absolutely. Is he capable of giving us a football game? I believe that, too. There have been some games with him that he has done some things that just didn't make a lot of sense. Uh, he's playing more within himself this year. But uh, I like the matchup for us. I think it's going to be a great ball game. Wish we could be there. Uh, we'll be on the opposite coast. Uh, need you guys to pull us through. All right, kids. Time for today's top ten list. As always, brought to you by CloseWithBlair.com. That's C-L-O-S-E with Blair, B-L-A-I-R.com. You can reach Blair directly at 601-500-2344. Again, 601-500-2344. Now, Blair is a mortgage expert. There are a lot of people in the mortgage industry. I would not steer you wrong about something this important. We have had countless Boneyard listeners entrust their mortgage needs to Blair Chandler, and it's come away completely satisfied. Uh, He recently shared a couple of five-star reviews with me from some of you. Uh, Didn't include a name. Just said, hey, this is a boneyard loan. Look what they had to say. Pretty impressive stuff. You're going to get great service. You're going to have an advocate with underwriting. It is a very complicated process getting a mortgage. If you've never had one before, let me tell you. You're going to need everything from a... um, lock of hair from your child's first haircut, a pint of blood, and a note from your mom. There's some underwriters out there that are playing for keeps. It's good to have somebody on that wall that knows what it takes to get you to the closing table. And that's Blair Chandler. Hit him up today. And uh, again, ask him too, maybe if uh, if you've got a young person in your life that is uh, just beginning life, and maybe they're out in the working world, getting married, beginning a family, and you want to help them buy a home, you now have the ability to do that within the state of Mississippi. You can co-sign on that loan and help them build some adult credit. Blair can help you navigate through that as well. Reach out to Blair Chandler at closewithblair.com. All right. Uh, I was supposed to be in South Carolina. The original plan was I was going to come to Knoxville. The wife finishes up next week. I was going to come up here, hang with her for a couple days, and then I was going to head over to uh, Columbia, South Carolina. You know, Ruby, the my Mustang, Ruby, love her to death. I bought her in Lexington, South Carolina. She was eager to go, too, to kind of be back around her people. Well, she won't get to make that trip. Uh, so uh, I was going to be there Friday for the uh, Follywood deal. It's uh, if, you're, if you're a Bulldog fan, it's going to be in town for the game. And you're looking for something to do. They're going to have this great event uh, for you guys there at uh, in Columbia. The night before the event, it's free to attend. And there's so much out there, too. Like, my attitude's always been, man, if it's free, it's me. If it's free, it's me. And I don't know how you look at things. Maybe you're a person that likes to, uh, to spend your money. You know, I don't know. I don't know what you want to do. But uh, Friday night, you can go and enjoy... A night out with other Bulldog fans and kind of get into a festive mood and kind of get things rolling. How cool is that? Kind of Just go ahead and enjoy the full weekend uh, out there with, uh, with some other Bulldog fans uh, at, uh, in Columbia. If I can ever get it out, right? That's because I'm scrolling as I'm talking, right? I'm trying to get you all the details here because you deserve to know. And uh, so Ben Bounds is uh, our man on the scene there in Columbia, uh, out in the mission field of South Carolina. So Follywood Fan Fest, that's going to take place Friday, September 22nd at Steel Hands Brewing in Columbia. Steel Hands Brewing, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to basically run all afternoon and evening. It's 4 to 11. And again, it's an all-ages show. How many times can you go on the road and you think about that, right? Man, Steve, I'd love to be able to go out, but... I got the kids with me. You can bring them. They're going to have live music, food, everything you need. It's going to be super. It's going to be absolutely super. Uh, just to give you an idea here, uh, they're going to have a Gritty Flywright, who is a Mississippi State alum, R.L. Cooper Music, and some other acts. Uh, it be pretty, pretty awesome there. Sponsored by Cathead Vodka and Hoyt Hayes Construction. 
It said 4 to 10.30. Now it's saying 4 to 11. So I guess we're trying to pack in even more fun. So be sure and go check that out. Again, that's Steel Hands Brewing in Columbia this Friday night. And so since I couldn't make it to the appearance... And, and Ben was great about it. He understood. And uh, I, I hate to disappoint people. It's uh, one of those things about me that um, my wife will probably tell you it makes me a people pleaser. I don't know that I agree with that. But I told Ben, hey, how about you do the top 10 list for us? And so he did. So this is the music of South Carolina. There's probably a band on here you're expecting. And they're here. They're not as high as you might think, but they're here. All right, so Ben Bounds... This is his top 10. I have not gone through and vetted these songs out. So if this list does not meet your level of satisfaction, uh, the burden of that lies on the shoulders of one Ben Bounds. But uh, I'm sure it's a great list. But number 10, Edwin McCain. Do you remember Edwin? I'll Be? Yeah, it's a song. If you haven't sung that at karaoke to your significant other, uh, what are you doing with life? Off the Honor Among Thieves album, it's the track Solitude. And he is a Greenville, South Carolina native. Be sure and check that one out. Number 10, Edwin McCain, Solitude. Number nine, from Clemson, South Carolina, it's a band called Craven Mellon. I don't know anything about these guys, but I like the name, and it kind of suggests to me that they're probably probably a jam band or something like that. Off the Red Clay Harvest album, it's the track Sweet Tea, dating back to 1997. Number eight, one of the legends, an American legend for sure. It's Chubby Checker. And what a great time. It's Pony Time Again album. I remember that. Do the Pony. I remember that. It's 1961. It's before my time. But I remember having that. My mom bought me, bought us that record. I don't know why. I guess she wanted to teach us to twist. I can still twist. And so uh, Chubby says, let's twist again. That's your number eight song. Chubby Checker's Let's Twist Again. He is a native of Spring Gully, South Carolina. Number seven. It's some crazy boys from uh, Charleston, South Carolina. However, the front man of the band Guilt Ridden Troubadour is from Vicksburg, Mississippi. How about that? How about that? And it's co-written with Blue Mountain frontman Kerry Hudson from Summerall, Mississippi. I know right where that is. That's down in the 601, in case you're confused. Uh, I even know where Olo is. You know where Olo is? You know where Olo Flats are? Yeah, I do. But it's the song Lights, and again, uh, some Mississippi ties to this great song, and a band founded out of Charleston, South Carolina. Another band from Charleston, it's Band of Horses, off the Everything All the Time album from 2006. The track is The Funeral from Band of Horses. Number five, we mentioned him. You're going to be able to see him live. He's the headliner at the uh, the Follywood Fest this weekend. How about that? How about that? He makes a top 10 and he's headlining a show for you guys. Man, our guy Gritty Flyride has arrived from his famously unknown album from last year. It's Load the Gun. Gritty Flyride, Load the Gun, number five. And again, you can, if you like this song, make your way out to Steel Hands Brewing this Saturday, this Friday, excuse me, and see Gritty in person. You might could even get your picture made with him. I'm sure he'd be happy to sign some merch for you. All right, number four, it's uh, Shovels and Rope. And it's a great track, Boxcar, from the self-titled album from 2008. Here's cool. Carrie Ann Hurst's parents, both Mississippi Delta natives. She grew up in Nashville before moving to Charleston, South Carolina. Yeah, so some, some Mississippi roots here for Carrie Ann. I'm sure she's a lovely and talented lady. Number three, the band you've been waiting for and you thought these guys would be number one. And if I put this list together, they probably would have been number one. But again, this is Ben's list. It's Hootie and the Blowfish. Now, rather than go with, uh, you know, an original Hootie and the Blowfish track, which you know is a rule for the top ten. So we have to go ahead and deduct some points from Ben's performance right here. We don't do covers on the top ten list. I mean, we could have gone with I Will Wait, could have gone with Hold My Hand, but he didn't. He went with Use Me, which is a Bill Withers cover, which if you don't know Bill Withers, I don't know what you've done with your life. I mean, an incredible performer. But from Columbia, South Carolina, it's uh, Hooting the Blowfish from the Scattered, Smothered, and Covered album, 
And if you live in the South, you know exactly what that's a reference to. Number two, it's the Godfather of Soul, baby. James Brown. You know this one? Get up. I feel like a sex, I feel like being a sex machine. Yeah, parts one and two. From 1970 and a native from Barnwell, South Carolina. Did you know that? Did you know James Brown was from South Carolina? You probably thought he was like from Brooklyn or Harlem or somewhere like that. No, no. Good old Southern guy. Number one, though. And I, this band would have been uh, pretty high on my list, too. It's one of these things you look at. You begin to think, okay, yeah, these guys, they got some staying power here. And uh, picked one of the best Marshall Tucker Band songs. That's your number one artist, Marshall Tucker Band. And it's Fire on the Mountain from the Searching for a Rainbow album uh, back from 1975. They're natives of Spartanburg, South Carolina. How about that? So, Ben, good job on the list, man. And uh, we may do this from time to time. And uh, as you know, sometimes your good friend and host struggles to find ideas. And I also like to have people that uh, perhaps have, uh, you know, maybe some uh, some better knowledge of music from their region, right? So, uh, so Friday, we will get into Shane Beamer's list, or Saturday, excuse me, which uh, he did pick Hootie and the Blowfish. And I'm going to be honest with you, Shane. I love Shane. I do. Shane, of course, was an assistant for three seasons under Sylvester Croom. I think that's a political pick. I, I just, I, as much as I love Shane, I don't think that's really his favorite band. I think, you know what, I think Shane's always recruiting, right? And so, hey, well, let's pick a band from Columbia, South Carolina. Well, the biggest band ever from Columbia, South Carolina is Hootie and the Blowfish. So while I respect the choice, I think it's somewhat disingenuous. I'll just say it for how I feel. And of course, I'm being silly. Uh, but yeah, so Friday, we'll come back and we'll do, uh, or Saturday, whatever day we do the show, the final show this week, we'll do another Hooting the Blowfish list. And we won't do any covers, Ben. There'll be no covers. We're not going to do Wagon Wheel. We'll do Darius Rucker. Did, did he, maybe he picked Darius Rucker. I think he did pick Darius Rucker. It wasn't just Hootie, it was Darius, which will enable us to uh, expand the catalog a little bit. Yeah, so we'll do that. Uh, later this week. And again, thanks, uh, Ben, for your contributions to the show. And best of luck with uh, Follywood Fan Fest this Friday. And again, please turn out and support that. Uh, listen, I'm a big proponent of Bulldogs getting together. And one of the things that frustrates me from time to time, not I'm not going to give some big thing about attendance at ball games, but there are a lot of people that go out there and do a lot of work to give you guys some entertainment choices when we're on the road, whether it be through the Alumni Association or an independent group. A lot of people put these, uh, you know, these pep rally type things together, or let's all get together and, you know, break bread and maybe you guys have a brew. And then I've been to some of these and they're packed. I've been to some other ones and it's like nobody shows. And so I'm just asking you as a bulldog, please turn out for these events. If you have the ability to go and have the time to go, rather than just pal around the hotel room or I'm going to go to Outback or whatever, go stop by for a little while and at least you know, spend a little time and money and uh, thank these people for their efforts for helping bring our fan base together. That's an amazing thing that people do. And I, I want to commend Ben uh, for all he's done and uh, attempting to include me in this. I wish we could be there. But uh, again, we will be in San Diego Friday. I don't know what we'll be doing Friday night, but we'll find something to get into. Don't ever threaten Dana with a good time. I can promise you that. Uh, We'll find something to get into while we're out there in San Diego, and then we'll have a good day Saturday, kind of getting to know that city. So, um, but there you go. Again, if you have ideas for the top 10 list, reach out, let us know. Uh, Best way to do that is to hit up Roy Samante, my friend Roy. Hit him up on Twitter at dogmatic67, that's D-A-W-G-M-A-T-I-C-6-7. Maybe go ahead and push the follow button. He's not going to be tweeting out pictures of his breakfast, right? That's just not who he is. It's usually our list and like Mississippi State-related stuff. So it's not a guy that's going to crowd your timeline with a bunch of silliness, right? There's a lot of people out there. It's like they live to post memes, and I appreciate those people. But uh, sometimes they duplicate the memes, and I, I think it's a one meme deal with me. I think it's you know, once you've done it once, you can't go back and repeat it, right? It's kind of like the, the memories on Facebook. You know, it's, hey, we've already, we've already had this memory once. So 
Uh, and you can follow me on all forms of social media at Scout Steve R. Be sure and, uh, and check us out uh, when you do. All right. Next segment of the show brought to you by Campus Bookmart, a Stark building and institution. I love Campus Bookmart, and you should too if you don't already. I was texting with Miss Kathy Brown earlier. Uh, Miss Kathy Brown and uh, some of the fine folks from Campus Bookmart made the book. How about that? They, the uh, my agent and the publisher put together a uh, a photo gallery, and there's some pictures of me that uh, I don't look quite as cool as I do these days. And I'm okay with them being out there. It's been an incredible transformation for me. And uh, I saw a picture from mine and Dana's renewal service, and I think that's the last time I've had a real haircut. Just so you know. And that was right around the time she turned 40. And I won't tell you how old she is now, but uh, you know how long my hair is, so you can kind of m- maybe do the math. Yeah. But uh, Campus Bookmark, man, I love those folks there, man. They've been so great to me. They'll be great to you, too. It's not because I'm so doggone special. It's because they are. They're going to treat you like family because in their minds, you are family. Nobody doing a better job selling Mississippi State merchandise than Campus Bookmark. Go by and see their smiling faces and meet your new friends. Uh, next time you're in town, if you can't make it to town or perhaps game day's not a great shopping day for you, visit them on the World Wide Web at campusbookmart.net. And by being a Lawyer Boneyard listener, we'll give you a phrase that pays. And that's BSR, which stands for Beautiful Steve Robertson. That gets you free shipping on all orders over 75 bucks. And you order less than 75 bones. Absolutely incomplete. All right, so I want to spend some time talking a little bit about some of the things that I see. Of course, I didn't get a chance to go to media opportunities this week because uh, I left Monday morning uh, to come up here and uh, to get to Knoxville in preparation for this trip. But uh, I have been kept up to date on everything. I've, uh, I've read everything that our guys have posted over jeanspage.com. And you may not know this, but all of our content, all of our team content is free. Uh, there will be some times we do some things that are our VIP is an exclusive interview. But anything we do in the big room, we do for free. Uh, so if you're looking for a hub for your Mississippi State coverage, uh, please come be a part of that. And uh, here's the thing, too. Uh, starting today, uh, I don't know what time they'll flip it, but uh, you know, for, we're going to run a two months special for one buck. You get two months of jeanspage.com on 247 Sports Network for one dollar. How cool is that? You so say, you know what, Steve? Yeah, I see these deals you run all the time. 50% off an annual subscription. Still, that's a big deal for me. You know what? We're going to give you two bucks for one month. Excuse me, two months for one buck. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So you give us a buck, we'll give you two months of the best coverage you're ever going to find about Mississippi State sports. And uh, that'll run today. But, um, you know, a lot of discussion. You know, people are like, Steve, what do you think? You know, what do you think? You know, because, you know, Steve, you're a lot closer to the program than we are. And there are some people, obviously, that have some access that other fans don't. But um, I'm very concerned about the offense. And, uh, you know, again, it's like the very first ball game, and I talked about this some on Monday show. So we got off to a slow start, and you could kind of excuse some of that in week one. You say, well, you know, it's a new offense. you got to get lined up right. There's always some you know, new players and new spots. We didn't have tight ends before. So it made sense that we'd struggle a little bit in the first half, and, of course, we'd out-athlete them in the second half. We won 48-7. And you say, okay. And then you look at week two, and you, you, you jump on Arizona – and, uh, you know, you're about to run away with that ball game, and then you don't. And you should have. And listen, give Arizona some credit. They're a better team than they were last year. They are. But so should we be. Even though we've had some, you know, some changes, you know, we're one of the most veteran rosters in the country. And so, yes, they're an improved team. Yes, they have had a, a dress rehearsal against our defense, but defensively, we played pretty well in that ball game outside of these mad scrambles. And there were a couple other plays, too, that were inexcusable, like giving up that 55-yard pass right before the half. I mean, those kind of things just cannot happen. But offensively, we took our foot off the gas. And I said in our recap of that ball game, sometimes success is the enemy of innovation. Because what happens as a play caller, you continue to just kind of ride the horse that's running the fastest, Right. You jump out there and say, hey, if we're getting four yards here, six yards here, 14 yards there. Let's just keep running the football. 
Well, then when they adjust, you've kind of gotten your quarterback out of rhythm. There, there's some things that we've done that are not quarterback helpful. And that's the thing with this scheme that maybe I misunderstood. Pardon me, I hit the mic there. Um, I expected this offense to be a little more quarterback friendly. Now, nothing's more quarterback friendly than the air raid, right? But we were told from the very beginning, I remember asking uh, Zach Arnett after we'd hired Kevin Barbet, you know, uh, you, you basically chose to retool the offense. And he goes, well, yeah, we're still going to be running a lot of the same concepts of the air raid in our passing game. And so I expected that to mean some continuity for Will. There will be some things that were kind of in Will's wheelhouse uh, that we were going to continue to implement. And that made perfect sense to me. I, I don't see a lot of similarities in the passing game through three games that we saw last year. Now, of course, it's a different scheme. But if we're going to run some of those same elements, when are we going to run them? That's the thing that, that, I, that kind of strikes me here is I think sometimes we're asking Will to do too much. And, and, and again, I, one of the things I get tired of, and I'm, I'm going to be honest with you about it, there's so many people that are so cruel and cold-hearted when it comes to a Rodgers. And this guy has gone out there and played his absolute heart out for this football program. He has. And, you know, there have been some games down the stretch he didn't play well. Like, like today there's this revisionist history and people are like, well, when's the last big game he had? You know, when's the last good game he had? Well, Arizona. He had a really good game against Arizona. We just didn't have him throw it enough. What was he, 14 of 18 in that ball game? Yeah, I mean, and, and missed on his first two throws. And, and listen, Will looks to me like maybe he's a little bit unsure of himself at times. He does. Will's going through a transformation as well. But I think we need to do some things that kind of make Will feel like Will again. Instead of, okay, this is what you do. You've never done this before, at least as a college quarterback. You know, maybe we put him in some situations where he's just comfortable. That's the big key for me on this offense. We've got to get Will Rogers comfortable. Period. We've got to get him more comfortable. Now, if that involves play calling, then, that, then that's, that's what it does. If that involves us settling the offensive line, because I'll be honest with you, I think this musical chairs thing that we're running at offensive line is not necessarily conducive to good offense. I think you pick your five and you roll with them, and later in ball games, or if somebody gets a little bit nicked up, you know, maybe maybe you make a change there. But you know, I think sometimes you know it takes time for an offensive line to learn to play with chemistry. It takes time. And obviously, we have two very good offensive line coaches. I'm not in any way suggesting that I know more than them. But I think one of the things that happens in pass protection, and with all the moving parts we have on offense, because we do a lot of pulling and we do a lot of shifting, there's a lot of things that we do. And so when you learn to play as a unit, when you have five guys working as one unit, I think the closer you can get to that standard, uh, the closer you get to it is going to be because of reps together as a collective group. Uh, that's how I see it. Now, of course, I don't know all the in, inside of this. You know, maybe, maybe there are some guys out there that are not performing up to expectations and they're they're working some other guys in to say, hey, you know what, we got to try another guy here. This guy's not handling his responsibilities. Yeah, I don't know that. I, I don't know the nuance of the plays. I don't know all the responsibilities or the keys. And you know what else? You don't either. Now, we all have strong opinions about this. But I never thought we'd look up in week three, and Mississippi State is the 14th offense out of 14 teams in the Southeastern Conference when it comes to total yards. And, guys, it's by a hundred, nearly 100 yards. Now, just ahead of us is Alabama. Now, their quarterback problems are well-documented. Really bad game last week, right? Uh, you look at Arkansas. They're right there at 12th. And that's with K.J. Jefferson, but they're, they're, they're missing their key running back at Rocket. So you'd expect them to have a little bit of a dip there. And then, But you got Missouri and Kentucky and South Carolina, those teams ahead of us offensively. <clears throat> that's just not going to work, okay? And so, you know, if I was going to give advice to Kevin Barbet, and nobody's asked me for that, but I'm going to give it to you guys because, you know, we're all friends. I would just tell Kevin, listen, simplify things for now. Go back to some base stuff. I know there's got to be some opponent-specific wrinkles. 
but let's maybe ditch some of these slow developing plays for a while to get our quarterback comfortable. And how many people are saying, you know what, Steve, we need to put Mike right in the ball game. Hey, I agree he needs to have a bigger role. But I also have all had the benefit of seeing Mike in practice. And guys, a lot of his misses are really big. They are. Now, is he an electric athlete? You better believe it. That guy's amazing. But I think we have underutilized him. And I think, again, go back to the Arizona game. If you never pass it, people never respect the pass. And so they're sending five, six, seven guys. As soon as Mike snaps the ball, every one of those linebackers is firing off because they don't respect him to pass the football. Now, we we threw it last week, and I don't know that Will makes that play, to be honest with you, Uh, because Mike had to basically sprint out left uh, to to free himself. And then, of course, uh, he finds Antonio Harmon, who basically walks into the end zone. But the way that LSU was pinning their ears back and kind of getting off, I, I don't know that Will could actually, I don't know that Will could get to the spot to make that throw. And I don't say that to be critical of Will. I'm just kind of being critical of the entire package here. You know, here's the thing about sports. And I'm a big proponent of, of the mental aspect of things. Like, you know, I, I, I've told you guys before, there are really two kinds of people. There are those who think they're going to make it and those who think they're not. The funny thing is both of them are right. I mean, you've got to have a positive mental attitude to get anything done in life. You're never going to luck your way into uh, much in life, you know, unless you just, you know, have a, a wealthy relative that passes away and gives you some big inheritance. you got to work for everything you get. But here's the deal, man, and, and take this from a former high school baseball coach that had to take high school wide receivers and turn them into outfielders and teach them how to bunt just to field a competitive baseball team. It doesn't matter how bad you want it if you're not good enough. That's important to understand. There are sometimes people say, well, you know, you know, Steve, uh, you know, the coach has got to get these guys ready. I go back to Jackie Sherrill. I mean, one of the first things that he would always say when he was questioned about this stuff, and you, if you were around back then, you know exactly what I'm about to say. Jackie's answer was always, well, you got to have players. you got to have players. You could have the best game plan in the world, but if you don't have the personnel capable of executing that at the proficiency in which you expect – your game plan is worthless. You don't win on a game plan. You win on a scoreboard. And sometimes maybe you got to simplify the game plan a little bit. And, and I, I still don't know that we're utilizing the receivers enough. Um, you know, we talked about having balance. That was a big thing. We're going to have more balance. And uh, we have skewed too far in one direction. And, and I think in many respects we have done some things uh, to confuse our quarterback. And, that, that again, that's not to be critical of Will. I know many of you want me to get on here and just say, tell you that Will Rogers is the entire problem. We'll make a coaching change, make a, a quarterback change. Everything's going to be better. I just don't believe that. I don't believe it. I think there are some philosophical things that we have to evaluate as we move forward this year. And, again, maybe we're trying to do too much too fast. You get an SEC play, you know, it would be great if we're like Kentucky or these other teams that have uh, – you know, three games against the Mississippi School of Math and Science and then, uh, you know, Louisiana, you know, college at at, uh, at Pineville or whatever, you know, that'd be different. You know, then, then you can kind of mix and match an experiment and, and it's basically a glorified scrimmage. We haven't had that, that luxury. You know, we start out with an FCS team and go right into a Power 5 opponent and then play LSU. And you look at South Carolina, they're kind of in a similar situation. They've already played two Power 5 games Right out of the gate, you open up North Carolina, you know, you only get that one FCS opponent a year, but uh, their non-conference schedule is it, – South Carolina this year is tough. You get UNC and Clemson, it's tough. And I think we all see it for that, you know. And so I don't know that we know a lot about South Carolina yet because I don't know the quality of their, their, their team. I, I think they're concerned about their ability to run the football – I'm just kind of concerned about our ability to kind of line up and run a play. And, and that sounds kind of self-loathing. I don't mean it to. I just don't want it to be a jailbreak every play. Now, we're not going to see a lot of fronts like LSU. Is South Carolina as athletic up front as LSU? Absolutely not. And that's not to say they're bums. LSU defensively, I think by the end of this year, you're going to look back and say it's one of the better teams in the conference. I think that there was this uh, – you know, maybe this outlier against Florida State where uh, Florida State punched him in the mouth, and I think LSU struggled to respond. 
And a lot of people formed an opinion about LSU. I remember seeing it on the message boards. I mean, we're in the middle of that third quarter. Everybody's like, LSU's a 7-5 and five team. And I said, they're better than that. You know, you can't judge a team accurately based on their best game or their worst game. You can't. And hopefully we've played our worst game of the year. But it's interesting, you know, we, we're four games into the Zach Arnett era and he's three and one. Now, if we had, if we had told you that beginning of the year or, you know, when we made the change, you'd say, you know what, I'll take that. But again, it's, when you look at it in its proper context, as more information has come in, you look at this and you say, okay, hey, everything looked good on paper. Uh, and the problem with that is, is we don't play games on paper. You know, and so Zach and these guys got to figure it out. I, Zach Arnett's a winner. And I've said that on the on show many times. Winners find a way to win. It doesn't matter what the, the opportunity is. It doesn't, I mean, look at Michael Jordan. Of course, he's one of the greatest players of all time. Uh, and he went and, and, and was a decent minor league baseball player, right? He was never going to make the big show. But winners win because winners know how to work. Winners understand the value in competition. Winners simply find a way to win. And we have a winner of a head coach. And so, and that, the problem with that is, is you can't do it all, right? You've got to go and trust and empower your assistant coaches to carry out your vision with their personnel groups. And we're just not there yet. And, uh, you know, Kevin Barbet is a guy that's got an impressive resume. He is a young, enterprising coach. And uh, I think he's getting a baptism by fire. We're going to find out, I think, what Kevin Barbet is made of this weekend. I really do. And I think some of the things that we do have got to be a little bit simpler and, and move a little bit quicker because some of that stuff may work in the AAC. It's not going to work against an SEC defense. And I think he's learning that. And I think that's the thing that I think some of our fans have kind of moved on from is everybody has the ability to improve. And it's much easier to improve on the mental side of things at times than the physical side of it, Right. I mean, we're in season now. You're not going to be adding bulk. You know, you're not going to get any faster. But you know what we can do is we can tweak our play calling and our playbook a little bit to put you in a position to be more successful. And that's really where this thing uh, kind of lays for me. Yes, I'm concerned. I'm very concerned. You know, it's not just because of the fact that it impacts our business. I love Mississippi State. I want Mississippi State to be successful on all fields and courts of play. I want us to compete for championships. And that's one of the things, too, that, you know, listen, Clark Lee, I think, you know, Vandy talking about being the best program in the country is, is a joke. But I respect the guy for saying it. And the thing that I have learned about that, you can speak things into existence. He's like, hey, I want to do this. I don't know how, but I want to do this. And you start beginning to research that and you put some time and effort into it. And next thing you know, you can do it. You may not do it at the level that you want, you know, I know a lot of people out there that want to write books that uh, probably couldn't write a pamphlet. And, and I say that with as much love and respect as I can. It is a very difficult process writing books. And I can't even begin to imagine what it's like to put a game plan together or put a playbook together to go play and compete in the Southeastern Conference. So I'm going to stay in my lane. But I want to tell you that I think this offensive uh, philosophy can work, but we have got to change some things, especially when we play the elite teams in this conference. I'm not saying you got to dumb it down, but you've got to account for the fact that there is a talent deficiency. And when you're asking your offensive line to block for four, five, six seconds, you're asking for a sack. You're asking for a rushed incompletion. You're asking to look rough and ragged. And that's exactly what happened on Saturday. So all hope springs eternal as we get ready to head to Columbia, South Carolina. But uh, I think a lot of that's going to – I think if you start getting some continuity on offense, you're going to see some better play on defense too. It all works hand in hand. All right, final segment of the show brought to you by our friends, man. I told you guys I've made some new friends, and uh, they could be good friends to, yours, to you too. Listen, there are 156 acres of development property is being sold at auction Thursday, October the 12th. Go ahead and write your calendar. Many of you said, you know what, Steve, I've always wanted to open a business, or perhaps uh, own a piece of Starkville. How would you like to be neighbors with Mississippi State? How about that? You got the opportunity to do that, kids. You do, because uh, one of these tracks butts right up against the North Farm. There's so much of this, man, and I've been out toward the property. I absolutely love it. 
sewer, water, electricity, all in place. It's not like you're just going to buy a pasture. Like this place is ready for development. Uh, so you can visit Two Sterling Drive and uh, go by and be a part of all this. And uh, we're going to have some more showings Sundays after some home games. The next showings, Sunday, October 1st and Sunday, October 8th. It's going to be 10 to 2. And then the Wednesday before the auction, 10 to 2 as well. Uh, better deposit, 25000 for the entirety of the property. If you want all 156 plus acres, you can do that. Uh, 10000 per tract. And, there, and that's now been split into uh, five tracts. You can get more information uh, by visiting our friends at International Auction LLC. Their phone number is one 861 Again, 888-861-0999. Uh, how cool would it be to live five minutes from Duty Noble Field or Davis Wade Stadium or Humphrey Coliseum. You can tailgate at the house. And I have gone and seen these properties, and I've, and I've shared with you guys before, if I was moving to Starkville now and I had the the, uh, the resources, I think this is where I'd want to be, man. Because you're in the county, there's no zoning out there. And uh, if you're looking to do some developments, you can do that too. You know, If you want to go build maybe a multi-family complex out there, you can do that. Maybe that's an investment property for you. Maybe it's one of those situations, too, where you're like, hey, you know what, Steve? Uh, I'm going to retire up there, and I want to build, like, some apartments and just live off of that. You can do that. It's pretty cool. And, again, I love looking at all this stuff. you got the, the western parcel is 10 acres. It butts up against the north farm at MSU. Very scenic, man. How beautiful is that? And you've got right along Highway 82, you got 20 acres right there. Right, I guess it's actually 182, but um, you got 20 acres right there, and that it butts up. So that, like, if you want to put some apartments, it'd be great. There's the center parcel with 18. My favorite though is the Sandy Creek parcel. It's 85 acres, and you got all these lakes out here, man. It's amazing. Many of you have thought about it, man. You said, you know what? One day I want to move up there. Well, this is a great chance for you to do that. And again, uh, it's going to be coming up here before you know it, man. On the 12th. So uh, we'll keep reminding you about it, but uh, it, it would behoove you to get out there and go check it out and uh, just maybe do a ride through out there and go to one of those viewing sessions and kind of get some more information. I think you'll be glad you did. And again, everything is pretty much there from an infrastructure standpoint uh, for you to go ahead and get started. It's going to save you a lot of time, money, and development. All right, let's spend some time. We had a baseball scrimmage on Tuesday as well. Uh, maybe you didn't know. But uh, since we're on the road this week, things are a little bit different schedule-wise. But um, we have pitched it a little bit better as of late. You know, Friday was kind of a, you know, kind of a rock'em, sock'em robot game. We kind of threw the ball around a good bit, and um, and we had a couple walks here and there. But uh, we had a really good day on the mound on Sunday, a little bit longer game. And uh, later in the ball game, it kind of got a little bit elongated. It was a 7-1 ball game. Uh, it's a 6 nothing game on Tuesday. And, uh, again, uh, great coverage by our Mike Nemeth out there. He's not just a uh, Heisman Trophy guy. Guy doing a great job on fall baseball. And, and Mike loves doing this. But uh, we saw Colby Holcomb make his uh, fall ball debut on Tuesday and uh, faced four batters and got three of those four. And then Nate Lamb, the transfer, the first transfer in the portal class from Mississippi State, also very effective out there. Uh, that's a big part of it, too. You know, uh, Luke Dodson, one of our freshmen, one of our dual position guys, RBI double, drove in two runs in the ball game. Steven Spoletta, we're getting a lot of talk about him. You know, people are like, hey, Steve, where'd this kid come from? Again, he was a two-lane signee, and all of a sudden they couldn't come up with all the scholarship money, so here he is, right? Uh, Gage Haley pitched, uh, had a nice nice outing for him too. And, um, you know, we got some new names you're going to have to become, uh, you know, familiar with. But um, there's a bunch of new arms that are going to really challenge here, really, really challenge for playing time. Pretty big. Uh, we haven't mentioned Brett House here, uh, but he we had in our fall ball coverage we did on on the article but, but uh, Brett House with a double that uh, nearly left the park today. So it's good to see Brett get a hold of one. 
Um, Logan Forsythe is a guy that has kind of been up and down. He's, he, he appears to have good stuff, but he doesn't miss a lot of bats. And uh, he had a 1-2-3 inning today. A name that we continue to discuss is Will Passo. And uh, this is another guy, too. Every time he comes out there, he is going to be a product of Prover Community College. He is going to be a guy that we can bring out of the bullpen, kind of a change of pace guy, can land the breaking ball for a strike, can, stop, can spot the change up for a strike. Uh, can, comes in today and uh, three up, three down today. Three up, three down. Uh, Tyler Davis comes in late. Uh, pretty good outing for him. And, you know, Tyler has been kind of hit or miss. And to be honest, we expect a lot more from him. Uh, but Hunter Hines had four RBIs today. And, again, I didn't get to see it. Mike did. But the thing that – this is the first scrimmage that I missed. But people continue to ask me. It's like, Steve, you know, what do you think? You know, there's always so much you can tell from fall baseball, right? Because you're playing yourself. But it doesn't matter who you're playing. The strike zone doesn't change. And one of the things I like about what we're doing is we don't have a live ump out there. You say, but, Steve, how are we calling balls and strikes? Well, I'm so glad you asked is we're using a TrackMan technology, and it's up there on the screen, right, it's for everybody to see exactly where the pitch was, exactly what the velocity was, exactly what the exit velocity is. And so it's all up there, so there's no hiding, right? And it's not – you get an umpire that just kind of gets on a roll with a pitcher and uh, starts allowing him to expand the strike zone. It is what it is. And I think this is big for us for a couple reasons. Number one – it's teaching our hitters exactly what the zone is. There are a lot of high strikes that get called by track men that maybe aren't getting called by umpires. But there are other times that, you know, that strike is called, depending on who's behind the plate. Maybe it's Messia one week, and then the next week it's Costello. And uh, Costello likes the low pitch and the wide pitch and the over-the-head pitch and all that kind of stuff. But – Basically, you're learning a truer zone. And that's one of the things that people were talking about last year. They said, you know what? The reason home runs are up around college baseball, especially in the SEC, home runs are up, ERAs are up, walks are up, is because you're getting a truer zone. I think what we've learned is that the parameters that we used TrackMan last year were a little bit too restrictive for pitchers. We didn't give them corners. And now we're adjusting a little bit, and that's that's all part of it. We're, we're tweaking. You know, we're always tweaking to try to get it right because the first installation of anything is always the worst, no matter how well intended it is. And so we're tweaking. And so we're going to have a little more of a pitcher-friendly zone from what I'm hearing from people in SEC baseball. Not much, but they're going to give you corners. And so you're kind of already adjusting to that. And so I think pitchers, number one, are getting a truer zone. But hitters are also seeing a zone of what really is a strike and not necessarily what maybe somebody says it is. And that's important to understand. Uh, everybody wants to know how Justin Parker's doing. You know, I, I think he's doing great. And I, I've talked to a couple people that uh, have shared some information with me that uh, have, have basically told me, hey, listen, Parker is figuring this thing out. He's trying to figure out who he has and who he can trust, who he can develop, you know, and uh, here's interesting, some things I want to share with you, too. Uh, I've seen this and I've heard this from people very close to the team, that this is a very, very close group. And one person shared that with me over the weekend. I talked to somebody yesterday on my drive in Knoxville. It said a lot of that is because of DJ and Ross, that they're, it's their team, right? It's like you get here. And you're a freshman, and you can't really say anything because you know what? You're a freshman, no matter how good you are. But now that they've had a year in the program, and there's been so much change on the roster, it's their team. And they're very outgoing and gregarious. And as a result, the younger guys feel already like they're part of it. Oh, that's Dakota Jordan, right? So there's not all this, you know, there's this hierarchy, I guess you could say. Not that that's necessarily a bad thing sometimes, but... From what I hear, that the group is all very, very, very close. And it's not just a couple of guys. You know, Hunter Hines is one of these guys that kind of leads by example. He's not a big rah-rah guy. But Hunter is more than happy to let Ross and Dakota go out there and get in people's face if they need to. 
Uh, this freshman group, we've talked about how good these pitchers have been, and, and you've got, you know, Spalletta and Dodson and uh, Jackson McKenzie and these guys out here just, you know, doing a great job for you. These freshmen have come in ready to work. Now, we talk so much about Dylan Cobb. He is the real deal. He is. And you can see why people are worried about, is he coming to school? This kid is physically fit. This is a kid that understands the game of baseball. That's important to understand. But these guys have shown up ready to work. That's one of the reasons they came in early. Now, I don't know that, um, you know, that you got a Brent Rooker or a Jake Mangum or a TA or a Rowdy or somebody like that. I don't know if you have that. Um, but what I do see and what I have heard is um, collectively as a group that the veterans on this team, they're all kind of holding each other accountable. And I don't know that we've had that since TA and Rowdy left. You know, one of the things that I was told, and this should come as no surprise to anybody, when T.A. was here, if you did something stupid, you you better hope Lamonis or Gotro got to you before T.A. did. Because T.A. is not your coach. He's not going to hold your hand. He's going to get in your face a little bit. He's, gonna, he's also going to pat you on the butt. He, he'll chew on you a little bit. And, all right, let's go, baby. Let's go. Uh, we hadn't had that since those guys left. I think you all know that. And that's not to be critical of anybody that, that was, you know, that came back. We had a lot of guys that kind of led by example, but really wouldn't go kind of get in people's face, you know. Um, so that's understandable. But from a leadership piece, it appears some things are getting better. Um, but again, the whole thing with Parker, they tell me that, you know, Justin Parker is a guy that really focuses on the small mechanical things. You know, one of these aim small, miss small guys. It's like, hey, let's tweak this a little bit. Let's aim here. And that there is a lot of movement stuff with him. You know, before we just kind of got out there and rock and fired. It's like, okay, listen, we believe in you. Uh, we love you. Let's call a slider. You know, and, uh, you know, Fox is a friend of mine, man. I love Fox. I do, and uh, very happy that he has another opportunity somewhere. I wish him and his family the best, and I think in many respects he was uh, he was kind of vilified unfairly at times. I mean, the guy had a ton of injuries, but I think in the end he kind of got shell-shocked, and um, he's like, here we go again. But Parker is coming with a new approach, and I, I can tell you when, when I went in to interview Justin Parker, you had a couple of your Bulldog pitchers in there just kind of working on their own and kind of working on movement. Um, and, of course, when I say movement, doing some stretching type exercises uh, that enable them to have better mechanics throwing, which, of course, hopefully will reduce injuries, but also, too, increase strike throwing. But I have not spoken to anybody connected to Mississippi State baseball uh, that is not convinced that Justin Parker is going to make a big difference with this team this year, that the players are completely bought into what he is instructing them to do. All right, again, done so, go to whenthebottomfalls.com and you can pre-order the newest book. Everything is, I mean, the hay's in the barn. We're just waiting on this thing to print. We should have a delivery date for you here in the next uh, week or so. Um, yeah, I've signed off on Perth with caption pictures. I mean, there's just, you know, now we're just waiting. You know, we're waiting to get things done and get books on the shelves. And uh, it's a very important book for me. And I'll be honest with you, I looked at the final proof and I shed a few tears. I did. I'm very proud of that book. And very eager to share my story with you guys. And uh, again, a lot of things in that book that uh, even some people in my family don't know about. They're going to they're gonna be surprised just like the rest of you. But uh, also, too, some pictures that uh, the publisher picked you know, to use. Kind of a surprise to me. But uh, I'm eager for... Uh, I shared one or a couple with some friends tonight that uh, made the book and didn't know it. And that was pretty special to me to be able to share that with them. And I'm not going to embarrass them. Uh, with their responses, but uh, it was very emotional. It was. But there are a lot of people that have uh, done some really good things in my life, and I appreciate all their contributions. And if you're looking for Stark Villains gear, you can find it at StarkVillains.com. And don't forget, too, the next few days, uh, two months of JeansPage.com on the 247 Sports Network for just $1. Be sure and come be a part of our merry band of misfits. Until next time, Let's all live our lives in a way we make more friends than enemies and people can see a difference in the way we live.